Hi, I'm Kat Parnell, and I'm with Birch Bark Editing, and it is, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to an event that I have been looking forward to for months. I read Jeannie Marshall's book, All Things Move, a while back, and I, I, I read it again this past week, and I'm just blown away. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation about the Sistine Chapel. Before we get started, I'd like to just make a few announcements. The first is that I am with Birch Park Editing, and uh, we run on the goodwill and people buying us cups of coffee. So if you feel so inclined, um, please head over to our website and uh, buy us a cup of coffee. We do have an event coming up on Tuesday, May 9th. It is our, um, uh, our one of our workshops called Mix and Meet. We welcome writers, we uh, provide prompts, we provide feedback, and in general, we have a very, very good time. As I said, it's my great pleasure to be uh, hosting this event along with my co-founder, Max Frazier. And, um, I, you know, I, Jeannie Marshall and Judith Baumel will be uh, our guests this evening. Jeannie's uh, bio goes like this. She is a writer who has been living in Italy with her family since 2002, a nonfiction author, journalist, and former staff's feature writer at the National Post in Toronto. She contributes articles to Plains and The Walrus and has published literary nonfiction in The Common, The Literary Review of Canada, Brick, and elsewhere. And her website link will be in the chat. And I encourage you to buy this book, which I'm just going to hold up because it's just such a beautiful, beautiful book. It's it's hardcover, um, it, and it the, the, the art, the plates in it are are just stunning. Um, buy it; it's a great gift. Um, uh, so are you this? You want all the people in it? And Jeannie, I'm going to be out of. Be in, uh, in be discussing uh, Jeannie's book. Uh, a few words about um, Judith Baumel. Her books are The Weight of Numbers, uh, for which she won the Walt Whitman Award. Uh, now, The Kangaroo Girl, Thorny. She's Professor Emerita of English and founding director of the Creative Writing Program at Adelphi University. She served as president of AWP, director of the Poetry Society of America and was a Fulbright scholar in Italy. Uh, the link to her website will be in the chat. We do encourage you to post your questions in the chat. I know you will have many after you hear Jeannie read a little bit from her book. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeannie. She's going to read. Hi. Um, I did want to say that it is really late here. It's one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I know that uh, at least one other person is up with me here. So it's dark and my eyes are a little bit red. So forgive me if I stumble a little bit as well. But uh, I'm going to start reading and uh, I'm going to read from very early on in the book, the first chapter, because I think it can kind of help to give you a sense of what it's about. So every chapter I, I began in the Sistine Chapel with a different part of the Sistine Chapel and then move out into the street or into life and to other places. So this is in the Sistine Chapel, in fact, my third visit there when I finally started to figure something out. Okay. I managed to get a seat on a bench under the scene of the flood where I could rest my head against the wall while I looked up. The deluge is the end of the story, the end of the world as no one knew it. Though this is the last of the sequence of central panels, Michelangelo painted it first. He painted the destruction of the world before its creation. He considered himself a sculptor rather than a painter, and art historians speculate that he wanted to warm up before he painted God. I tried to find my way into this image by noticing the details that I had read about before I came to visit. Details such as the white patch in the sky where the plaster fell off in 1797, when the gunpowder depot at Castel Sant'Angelo exploded. Though it's hard to see from below, a woman carries a jug nestled between the legs of a table that she is balanced upside down on her head as she walks out of the water. Michelangelo had a similar jug in his own kitchen. These facts allowed me to focus on a few particulars providing a way into this part of the fresco. 
But then, as I looked at the people struggling to get out of the water, it occurred to me that they're not survivors, as I had so lazily been thinking of them. No one who isn't in the ark survives this flood. These people are about to die. The water is rising. This image captures a moment when they still have hope, but we know that their hope is misplaced because we know this story. In these circumstances, the table and the jug will be useless to the woman who has gone to so much effort during her last moments on earth to carry them with her. The mother and her children will not survive. They don't know it yet, but we do. Everything that seemed important before the flood is now inconsequential, and yet there's a woman carrying a table and a jug. I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. This is what God says in the King James Version of Genesis and the story of the flood. These people have become wicked, he says, and their hearts evil. The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth, says God to Noah when instructing him to build the ark. But Michelangelo doesn't depict these people as God describes them, and instead we see people emerging from the water naked and vulnerable, helping and carrying each other, rescuing a few practical household items in the hope that their lives will continue and they will need them. It's the artist's sympathy for God's victims that made me see them as survivors before I thought about the story. It's our tendency to identify with Noah and his family, the actual survivors, but this depiction causes us to consider the fear and anguish and even the humanity of the condemned. Seen through half-closed eyes, the deluge resembles a picture that has been partly whitewashed. The world is a picture that God can unpaint at any moment, wrote art historian Andrew Graham Dixon, who seemed, like me, to be transfixed by these shades of grey. I had read that line before I ever saw the fresco, but now I could see how the artist painted the sky meeting the flood water in a way that obliterates them both, as it does in reality, in the pale light of a storm. He used the same shade for the sky and the sea, a pigment made by friars in a convent in Florence from roasted cobalt and glass, and then ground, likely by one of Michelangelo's assistants, until it reached this deathly pale blue verging on grey. This panel is more detailed than the other frescoes, and is even harder to see from the ground than most of them. But resting on the bench in that room, looking at the blue greyness of the water, the sky and the clouds, I thought of a smothering airless nothingness. The sound of shuffling feet and murmurs fused into a, hu a hum. The movement of people around me changed character and became like a slowly swelling wave that never crests but only dissolves before it swells again. It's one thing to know the story of the flood and another to feel it, to feel the loss of anything like hope or future and to sense the blunt force of finality. Annihilation is in the midst of happening in this image, but this is destruction by God. And this image tells us to seek redemption, to change our lives, or we'll be dragging ourselves and our useless possessions onto a shore that will not save us. Do it now with it while there's still time. There's something menacing, wrathful, and angry going on up there, and it feels like a warning. <clears throat> I shivered while I watched my fellow men and women stumbling about underneath, looking up to the ceiling and tripping over other people, looking down to find their way but missing what's going on above. All these people in the chapel had their own reasons for being there. Some were devout Christians, some were art lovers, some were checking it off their list of touristic sites. I still wasn't clear about my own vague motivations. We all want something from the Sistine Chapel. We want to understand it, but we also want some of its glory sprinkled upon us like holy water. We want to take hold of the messages painted in the plaster to gain some insight into life here on earth and to figure out how to live. We want to be people who have seen the Sistine Chapel, but even our shallower motivations lie on top of something more profound, the desire to see and be touched by greatness and to discern its meaning in our lives. When we arrive, if we're really looking, we'll see that Michelangelo is not showing us something beautiful, though there is beauty in it, but horror and destruction, the possibility that all our worldly concerns are pointless that if the world ceased to exist, both our most precious and utilitarian objects would amount to nothing. We were nothing and will be nothing. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt thou return. 
Michelangelo blends the sea and the sky at the horizon into a void, an unbearable emptiness. Yet to recognize that void is somehow thrilling. As I sat there, head against the wall and mostly oblivious to the irritation I was causing by taking too much time on the bench, I felt like I'd experienced something essential and terrifying. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Wow. Th thanks, Jeannie. Um, I have a whole set of questions I wanted to ask, but at that moment, the last line you just read makes me think about something you said about Goethe, who took a nap in the yes. <laughs> chapel. So um, <laughs> what was, the, before I ask you, like, to tell us a little bit about the structure of this book, which is quite amazing and original, what was the Goethe nap story? <laughs> Well, uh, now I've forgotten where I read. Oh, it must have been in his, you know, his uh, his stories about traveling through Italy. But it was just that he would wander in and there was no one to guard the, you know, to stop you from going in. So he would go in quite regularly and he wasn't the only one. But people would just wander through, take a walk around. It wasn't a busy place. So probably that bench that I had to, you know, struggle and elbow my way into, he probably could just stretch right out and have a nice snooze there. I like to I like to imagine it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to share with some of the people, with everybody in the audience, how remarkable a book this is because it's looking at art, in fact, uh, the title is looking, learning to look in the Sistine Chapel, uh, but it's it's also functions a bit like a guidebook to Rome in mm -hmm. general, a bit of a guidebook to the highlights of the um, Vatican Palace. And um, it is, y you use contemporary photographs by, a friend of yours who's also a photographer, a novelist and a photographer. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how uh, Doug Cooper came to be part of this project. Um, we'll, we'll talk yeah. about your words in a little bit, but I really think that people might wanna realize how small, compact, perfect <laughs> guidebook this is. Uh, it's sort of a, 21st century companion guide to Rome, the Georgina Masson book. So talk a little bit about Doug and, okay. and how the contemporary photos fit. How that happened. Okay. Um, well, I think it was partly because I'd written the text, of course, and then, uh, it, you know, in my initial draft, I just put images that I could find of the Sistine Chapel in it but I put a few snapshots of my own and it seemed to make sense to have some pictures, but I'm I'm not a very good photographer and I'm just, I don't even know how to use my iPhone very well. So my photographs were not great, um, but I, I thought about other photographers and most of that I could think of were partly too cheerful. You know, there's a tendency in Rome to take beautiful pictures because it is a beautiful city, but you, you know, so often, you're trying to you know, reach your camera around the trash on the street so you can get the one beautiful shot of St. Peter's, you know, along, you know, with a view of the Tiber. And I knew that Doug, uh, he didn't avoid the trash. He just kind of took the pictures. And people always like to look at them because if you live in Rome, people always say, oh yeah, that's, that's the Rome that we all walk through every day. That's the place I know. And uh, it was also during the pandemic, he was on his own with his little dog and he would slip out of his apartment. He lived in, right in the center and take these amazing photographs sometimes of the city in a way that you never really got to see it. And so that was kind of interesting. He also has this technique that it's not exactly black and white because he shoots in color, but he pulls, he pulls the color out. And sometimes he leaves just a little bit in so there's a sort of other texture to it. Uh, I don't know. He has a really interesting eye. There's a kind of like joy and melancholy that's all mixed into it. And I felt like that was a bit of, I mean, certainly my book has a strain of melancholy, but I think there's also a strain of joy in there too. And so I felt like I didn't even know him that well, but I felt like uh, he what he was doing fit. So I sent him the manuscript first 
and he is a writer and I was slightly terrified because he's also very uh tells you what he thinks and so um but he liked it and he also saw the the similarity and my words and his pictures and so we used some that he had already taken but then he and I went out and actually shot some photographs together like there was one that you just showed of the nun with the mask in the backpack and that was on the bus that uh I do actually write about taking that bus so we jumped on the bus again and he managed to get a fabulous photograph there it um but of course, you know, not being a photographer myself, I didn't really think about how to do it. I'm writing about something, sitting on the bus, looking at what I'm seeing, making notes, going home and expanding on it. But he had to capture it really quickly. And so originally I thought he would take pictures out the window, but it's all going past so quickly that instead he decided to take pictures in the bus, which I think was actually more inspired in the end. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there was some kind of serendipity there that something just happened and it came together because even the publisher, we weren't, we're, there was a slight hesitation because we thought his photographs are so uh, stylized and so distinct and it would be a commitment to use them. But once we started putting them in, it just worked. It just absolutely worked. Yeah, I think it's really great. Um, if I were a better tech person, I would be going back and sharing some more of the pictures, but I, <laughs> I sort of stumbled in the wrong way on this. Um, can we back up? Um, there's two things that strike me as really important uh, as you enter this, no this book, not novel, as you enter this guidebook. One is you start in the COVID lockdown, and the other is you remind us a few times, you are not a Christian. Mm -hmm. You say that specifically. And um, that I think it was, what, 10 years or so, eight or so, that you avoided going to the Sistine Chapel. You lived in Rome and it was kind of, you didn't go. So. Could you take 12 one? now that I think about it. I think it was 12 years in 12 fact. years. It's crazy, so you, I know. <laughs> would you take <laughs> one, one or either of those and just keep going? Like, all right, so it was 12 years you didn't go. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I did have a, a certain hesitation. I felt like I needed to understand this place. Um, you know, I do have an aversion to crowds like most people, and it's always crowded. And so at first, I just kept thinking, well, I have time. I've got lots of time. I don't have to go rushing over there. But I let it stretch out for a long time. And uh, after a while, I felt like there was, I had more hesitation than just that it was big and overwhelming and crowded. And I wasn't really sure what it was. And so part of the process in writing this book was sort of figuring that out. What was the hesitation? And in writing it, I was trying to, I was trying to make the words sound a little bit like they did in my head so that it was a bit like thinking and puzzling. And sometimes when I read them out loud, I'm not sure if that works when I read it out loud because it can sound a bit circular, like I'm just going around and around. But I think that's how I think. And I don't know if that's how other people think, but I, I sort of ruminate on something until I finally figure it out or at least come up with a theory of what I think is going on. And so going to the Sistine Chapel, at first it was just, well, I better go. I better, you know, go and see this thing that's been on my mind for a while and give it a shot. So the third time, in fact, the time that I finally got to sit on the bench and look at the deluge, that was, I thought maybe that would be my last, but it ended up, you know, sort of just really launching me into it after that. And I still, I keep, I've got, I've been, I mean, since I've finished it, I've still been back a few times and I realize I like to go by myself because it's just easier to go and look and think about it and find one patch of the ceiling and take it in. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't completely realize that I was walking into my own personal past as well with my mother and her, her strained relationship with Catholicism, but that started to emerge after a while and I started to realize that it wasn't wasn't a tangent it was really quite fundamental and it was certainly 
a part of why I think I was hesitant to go there. And it's partly because there were so many words I, this, that come around St. Peter's and that period. And one of them is indulgences. And my mother used to mutter constantly under her breath about the absolute, you know, terrible thing that indulgences were. I didn't really even, you know, she explained them to me. I thought that really, they did that. It was quite amazing. And so I started to realize that all these words were familiar because of her. And so the more that I read, the more I learned the Council of Trent, all these things, oh, right. I heard about that in the kitchen, washing dishes one night. You know? So I started to realize that it was all so interwoven that there was no way I could separate it. So I just brought it all in in a short book which is kind of <laughs> yeah well your no. um your description of the protestant reformation is the clearest <laughs> i've ever ever read and i've tried <laughs> and the shortest and i recommend it for uh, for for everybody well i didn't want to lose people so i didn't want to make it too long but it's pretty it's fundamental you really do have to understand it to especially to understand what happened between the ceiling and the altar wall mm. to Michelangelo and to, to the, to Catholicism as well during that time. So yeah, it was necessary. And a, a part of the period when I was writing that would have been 2017, which was, you know, the anniversary of Luther and his 95 thesis. So there was a lot of material that was coming out at that time. Just a lot of, you know, scholars were writing about it. So it was really easy to 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 find and to and it was interesting. I found it very interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, forgive me, Jeannie, if I read uh, one of my favorite early lines in this book out loud to everybody. Uh, for those of you who are following along, it's page 61. Uh, she says. My first visit to the Sistine Chapel was irritating. <laughs> All my experiences of it have been irritating in different ways. <laughs> I was beginning to see that this feeling that had seemed like an obstacle was actually a part of the experience of something that is so much larger than I expected. You know, it's funny, one of my son's friends asked me the other day, he said, so if I read your book, will I be able to go to the Sistine Chapel and not find it really annoying? <laughs> I said, no, I think you're going to have to go through that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not quite the shortcut he had hoped for, but. Um, I wonder if we should move on to your next uh, section. I've got lots more questions, but uh, we'll move on to your next section. And I'm going to try to kind of straighten out my PowerPoint photos while you're uh, doing that, so people can see some more of Doug's pictures. And um, and uh, could you keep reading? I'm impressed that you're doing that. Okay. Um, okay. I'll read another section. This is from uh, the fourth chapter. So. In this, this this one begins in the Sistine Chapel, uh, looking at the four corners. And I, I um, what did I call it? So I called that chapter "Looking for Salvation" because it just seemed to me that uh, the pendentive paintings are are have a lot to do with salvation, and it was something that was on my mind as well during that period. So this part that I'll read, it starts, this part starts um, when I'm just running errands, just ordinary errands that I had to do in the city. So I'd already left home, was on my way, and I was on the bus, this bus right here, the 280, if you're ever on it, it swings around the Tiber, it's a great bus. Okay, the bus passed a large stone marker along the river that notes when the embankment was built up. It took me a long time to understand why it said Anno Quattro. A friend pointed out that it was built under Mussolini in the fourth year of fascism. The fascist government was so convinced of its mission and of its strength, of its own goodness, that it renumbered time. As I read the contemporary fascist and anti-fascist curses scrawled on bridges, walls, and roadways in the heart of Rome, it felt like something was about to break. All these angry threats of annihilation 
each against the other, betray the tension. There were soldiers with automatic weapons in the metro and armored vehicles placed in pedestrian areas to prevent anyone from using a car or a truck as a weapon in a crowd. The streets of Rome had changed with the arrival of thousands of refugees from Africa and the Middle East, people fleeing violence while they were simultaneously being perceived as a threat to the cultural order. I got off the bus and walked through the Roman ghetto, past the armed guards outside the synagogue toward an art supply shop where I could buy watercolor pencils for Nicholas's school kit. I also had to buy a book as a birthday present for his friend. These were errands, simple tasks that I could tick off the list that I kept in a plain back black notebook in my purse. I'd only bought the notebook recently and decided to devote it to daily lists in another attempt to be grounded and practical. When I write out my chores in the mornings, I imagine I'm making the center hold. I'm preventing the pieces of myself from flying off in the vortex of an ordinary life. I never before understood that stationery could have such salvational possibilities. I make work lists on the left side and household lists on the right and spend the day keeping them in balance. On my way home, I'll buy a piece of beef and a bottle of wine, as I have reminded myself to do on the right side of the notebook, and I'll rip a couple of laurel leaves off the neighbor's hedge to throw in the pot with the meat, and then I'll make satisfying check marks against the completed tasks and feel like the day was successful. I'll have held off the encroaching chaos, that dimly perceived threat, threat of, sorry, that dimly perceived sense of threat once again. I walked over brass cobblestones placed in front of doorways to indicate that the people who lived there in the 1940s were one day forcibly taken to die in a concentration camp. These stones are all over Rome, but there are more of them in the ghetto. I continued through to the market in Campo dei Fiori and glanced at the dark hooded statue of Giordano Bruno placed up high, looking over the piazza, who was buried, oh, sorry, who was burned at the stake near that spot in this piazza in 1600. His crime was his belief, the universe does not revolve around the human being. God is no fixed point or central government, but rather is poured in waves through all things. All things move. I think of Bruno being silenced, as Heather McHugh writes in this poem called What He Thought. She describes the executioner's placing an iron mask over his face so that he couldn't speak. Others have described a spike driven into his tongue or a leather, thrust, leather strap tied to his mouth to hold his tongue still. The point is that he had to be silent since he was known to have been persuasive and eloquent. The spring sky turned gray over Bruno and the unexpected wind rattled the metal poles supporting the shelters over the fruit and vegetable cellars. There are some days when it's possible to run these kinds of errands through the center of Rome and see it simply as a very old, unique and beautiful place. But most days I can't help but feel the current of violence of organized and bureaucratic human brutality. This kind of violence is a measured and considered reaction to something that threatens a perceived sense of order, a reminder of the difficulty of knowing good from evil. Okay, that's the end of that part. <laughs> uh, Jeannie, all yes. things move. Yeah. Could you open that out a little bit? That's the title of the book. Yes. And so I, you hear it there in Heather McHugh's poem, but she is actually quoting um, Giordano Bruno, where he says, God moves in waves through all things, all things move. And uh, uh, now I've forgotten, I think it's from The Immense and the Numberless, that one of his books that he was working out his philosophy. And that uh, those words are more um, Ingrid Rowlands, I guess she translated his his work. And that's where it comes from. And it's to me, that part itself is slightly mysterious. God moves and waves through all things is, is more something I can grasp in a way. And all things move. I think I, I keep making it mean so many different things, but that's partly why I liked using it. And I also wanted to, I, I kind of wanted to draw this, this slight link between Michelangelo and Giordano Bruno because um, Michelangelo coming as he did earlier was able to explore so much more and ask so many questions that became heretical later and he had the same influences Jaws of Viterbo who I do talk about in the book was one of his huge influences and also was one of the influences for 
Bruno. So Bruno was coming along later and being affected by all of these, this, this you know, humanistic thinking that was happening during that time. But the world had changed. The the um, Protestant Reformation had changed everything for Catholicism. And so you couldn't really just ask those questions anymore. You couldn't really explore this world in the way that he was, that Bruno wanted to do, and in the way that Michelangelo did, and somehow managed to get away with it. So one was, one becomes known as the divine Michelangelo, and the other is burned at the stake in the fruit and vegetable market, you know, some years later. So I just wanted to do, I mean, I'm making a lot more of it here. I don't make that of it in the book, but I did feel like there was some kind of link between the two. And so I liked using Bruno's words for that reason. Yeah. Well, I do you recommend that book though, in, in, if, you, you know, if you're coming to Rome, you're interested. Um, her book about Giordano Bruno is really interesting because he's this statue up there and people crowd around him and a lot of people don't really know that much about him. So it is actually kind of was interesting to learn more for me as well to learn more about him. It is, you make a nice point in, in this section of what it's like to go to market at the Capo dei Fiori where this incredible moment of Christian history has taken place and and you beautifully talk about your daily shopping list and your <laughs> piece of beef. And um, I just, it, it makes me so um, envious, jealous, I don't know which word, <laughs> to you. Know, you live in Rome where the greatest things in the world have happened and, and yet you need your piece of beef. Yeah, I know, it's an interesting, I, that's always kind of amazed me in a way that, you know, you're, or, or maybe that's the wrong word to use. It's puzzled me in a way that, you know, I'm always thinking about wanting to have more time to read poetry and to read good books and to look at art and to think about the world and notice the world and think about my life. But I can't do it because I've got all this, these, I've got all this work I have to do. I've got all this laundry. I've got all these other things I have to do. But in the process of working on this book, I think I realized that is your life. You know, that's no one gets away with it. No one gets away without having to do all of these things and that they aren't separate, that it's all rolled in together. And yeah. certainly, I mean, shopping in Rome is one of those experiences for sure, because you're so surrounded by history and that market in particular. And I was, uh, uh, you know, somewhat shocked to discover that it was a fruit and vegetable market when they would burn people at the stake there and he wasn't the only one they did it they they did they did this to a few people there and to imagine that they would do that early in the morning then the vendors would come and set up and you'd buy your oranges and apples there yeah. it's yeah. unfathomable really yeah and that part of rome too is just uh it is hard to walk around there and not think about different periods of terrible things that have happened in the world yeah i mean in that world in that place at I'm, different I'm looking at some questions um and moira afar asks a really interesting question moira i've never met you but i wish i have she's a um, great person she's a yeah. very good friend <laughs> uh but i'm going to skip over yours for a second because sharon bryan uh the great poet, a uh, Seattle poet, asks a really interesting question about women doing their work while men go about doing the grand things. And I want to just mention that as you were talking, I was thinking what a beautiful frame this evening is, because you start with that housewife trying to save her table and her jug while the world is being destroyed and and it, it seems like a perfect match for the Campo dei Fiori <laughs> story and um I also wanted to say I don't know if we have time because there's now lots of great questions um there's a moment in the section of that of the book ancestors in which you notice something that I really appreciated which is that the names of the ancestors are all male Mm -hmm. but that Michelangelo is actually showing family groups with women. 
yeah been doing things and I'm wondering if you have a few moments to talk about that yeah uh, it's um I mean that section it's funny because people don't look at it as carefully and it's partly because it very likely much of it was painted by his assistants rather than him it doesn't look quite as it doesn't look quite the same it looks like he probably outlined it but they did the painting um but it is interesting to me that apparently historians would keep trying to match up which which ancestor the name with the person but you can't really do it and it doesn't seem that he was really trying to do that at all and to me, it did seem like, well, of course, there are women and children up there, and they are also the ancestors, or otherwise, who else are they supposed to be? And why wouldn't they be there? You know, it's, it, it is interesting. Well, it is. Why wouldn't they accept that great men do great things? Yes. <laughs> and, and great art often forgets, uh, you know, the canonical art often forgets that the women are there, you know, yes. as and you point out. Know, was, he, was he that sensitive? I, I, you know, it is really hard to know if he really was. And they are, they're a little bit mysterious in that way. No one really knows what, what was he thinking and painting the ancestors that way. It isn't really certain, but it seems almost obvious in a way. Well, th these are just families. These are just, you know, other people who are also related. So why not? You, and you have a beautiful moment early on where you look at the Madonna and you say, her child was born as a human child and she's worried about him. And yeah. she's worried about taking care of him. And, and I love that that insight as well, looking at at her. You know, she both knows that, or maybe she doesn't, I, I don't know. I'm gonna step away from the Christian theology for a moment. <laughs> and I wanted to ask uh, Max, uh, if you could take over some of these questions, because there are a gazillion great questions and I am not able to, to read them all. So maybe Max. Um, what was Moira's good question you, you mentioned? Oh, I will read Moira's while Max. Uh, you know, I'll go, I'll go ahead and uh, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll read in some of the questions. You tell me when you're happy to have the questions read in, though. Um, um, I'm ready to, I actually can read it and I'm ready to read Moira. Moira okay, yeah, read, read Moira. Moira and then there are some other really good questions here. It says, I will be curious to hear how practicing Christians, you know, particularly earnest, open-minded nun, for instance, <laughs> might appreciate your book. Have yeah. you had any responses yet uh, from religious Christians or have you thought about how you would respond to their POV and judgments? Well, um, there's one friend I have who who used to be the religion reporter at the newspaper I worked at, and he's a Catholic convert, and you know mm -hmm. that's all the you know, so he's pretty serious. Um, but we've had conversations about it. I warned him before he read it. I said, I don't, you know, I'm not convinced by the end of it. I don't take on, I don't become a Christian, and uh, he just teased me about it rather than anything but he found that it was I mean he liked the book very much and he didn't he found that it was respectful of Christian views um I also have another relative who is a, a practicing Christian and he also felt that way but I wrote an essay that was in the Globe and Mail on Saturday and <laughs> Uh, a friend I didn't look at the comments but a friend pointed out that there were a few angry Christians in there and that um, mainly they were annoyed that, I don't know, they were just annoyed at my, well, they kept calling atheism, like I think I'm more agnostic than atheist, but that that just seemed to, that it was just that, and they couldn't get beyond that, that how dare I even write about this subject if that's my position. So I'm sure that I will, I don't know. I mean, I, I find, I, I, I think it's interesting to talk to people who are serious about their religion and want to, you know, and also also understand the history. But um, if someone is very dogmatic, it's very hard to talk to them anyway. So, <laughs> but I'm not sure how I I'm not sure how I would deal with it if someone got really angry. I can't I can't imagine that anyone reading it get it and get actually angry. Maybe just the idea of it might make them angry though. 
Yeah, no, I think you're probably right. The idea of it would make them very angry. And Judy, I'm sorry, I interrupted. There's a another really great question, and it's in the in the chat, and it's about is there evidence of uh, Michelangelo being subversive in his uh, Sistine frescoes? For example, in the image of God, or the image of God emerges from a strange form which perfectly corresponds to the side view of the human brain. The meaning mm-hmm. perhaps is God comes from the human brain. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with that question. Well, um, some of what we see as subversive was was less subversive at that time. But it was certainly all about questioning, asking questions. And, uh, you know, uh, that one of the they think that one of the theologians who was advising him, although it's not for sure, was Giles of Viterbo, who was a an Augustinian, and he was very interested in Judaism, and he was interested, he spoke several languages, he spoke so many languages, because he also believed that you had to go back to original sources to understand anything, and he believed in um, the idea of the poetic veil in scripture, that scripture had to be written in this poetic form, because we were not capable of understanding it, yet this was the only way that we could get any kind of an inkling of it. And I found that idea to be kind of interesting. And he was um, a good contender for Pope at one time. And then because of the, um, because of the, the reformation of course, well, he also died too, but he sort of became forgotten about, but he was a, uh, an advisor to the Pope at that time to Julius II so I don't think it was all that subversive then, but it became more subversive subversive later. You know, they included pagan images with the Sibyls, um, but at that time, well, certainly much, much earlier, of course, when Christianity was new, they would try to say that the, the idea of Christianity was already embedded in certain aspects of, you know, previous religions. And so they were revisiting that idea in some ways with the pay, with the uh, with the Sibyls, but it wasn't really controversial. The more controversial thing was all the naked bodies. I mean, that was, so, but I don't think that bothered Julius II so much, but it did bother some. And certainly by the time he did the the Last Judgment, there was a lot more. I mean, he was questioning himself a lot more then, and there there is both uh, this desire to uphold Christian orthodoxy or Catholic orthodoxy, but also he's still kind of playing with these images by making Christ look like Apollo. And um, yeah, and just, you know, having, you know, references to Dante and it is really not, it, it's, he's not following the script for sure. And all the nakedness that so much of it was later covered up. There was one, what is his name, Volterra, who did painted a lot of the cloths, loincloths over the men. And he became known, I've forgotten the nickname, but it was basically like Volterra the diaper maker, something like that, that he became known as. Poor guy, for the rest of his painterly life, that was his moniker. Yeah. So I think, sorry, to answer the question. So I think some of what looks subversive to us now was less subversive at the time. And that's what I, that's actually to me what I found really interesting was that Chris, the Catholicism, while it was really corrupt in so many ways at that time, was also really fascinating and really intellectual in a way that it 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 had to change after the um, the threat from Protestantism. So we have a couple more questions here. Um, there are some of them. Are, there are some fantastic um, comments. Uh, one is about how long it took you to write the book. But before we come to that one, um, this is a very uh, interesting and, and somewhat personal question. Given your history with Christianity and the fact that your study of the chapel did not persuade you to become Christian, um, how has the process you went through changed your view of Christianity and its place in human history? Hmm. Well, I suppose I I, I I may have known that it was a newer religion, but I felt um, after reading and studying this, I felt how new it was in a way. And certainly living in Rome, of course, you see all these other uh, remnants of previous religions all around you in the ruins. Um, there are, you know, Mithraic altars in, in the bottoms of some of the churches as well. 
So that certainly, I certainly had a sense of it being a newer religion. But I think for me, what really changed was more that I didn't feel like I needed religion. I didn't feel like I needed Catholicism to to make my life make sense, I suppose. Although I do think it's an interesting way of looking at your life and of asking questions. And I I actually do think it's a wonderful way of asking questions and looking at your life. But I didn't, I found that I didn't need it. It actually kind of clarified that for me that I I, I can answer these questions for myself in different ways. And some of that is through art. And I know some people find that to be kind of a shallow you know, a less, I don't know, it's not, art is not spiritual, art is something else, but it does answer some of those questions, I think. And this, for me, was interesting, because it's art about spirituality, so it allows you to explore both sides of that in one place. Yeah, I don't know, I'm still maybe a little mixed up. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what good art does, is it makes us ask questions. And yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the asking, we hope to, uh, we hope to find an answer or two, not always, but we hope to. Um, here's a follow-up question, though. Uh, this book was uh, was in long gestation. Can you share anything about how it evolved? Was there a point where it shifted to include family, the past, your personal reflections, or was that always there from the writing? No, it wasn't the there. Workshop from the in Banff, beginning. actually, is the question. Sorry? The writing workshop in Banff. Oh, yes, because... Oh, yeah. In fact, it was the, um, it started as an essay. So at first I really only thought I had an essay in me and um, and I was able to do that in Banff, which was amazing. So I went there with this embryonic essay and that I had written and it was partly, it's the first chapter and some of the second chapter was more or less where the original essay started from. And that was a, a way of working out a lot of what I thought about, but I didn't really have a lot of the personal stuff in there. But something happened when I was in Banff that made me realize that it was coming. And it was that I was trying to talk about different pieces of art. And I showed everyone in the workshop this picture that is an, a painting that is in um, the Pinacoteca di Brera. And it's one of the depositions. So it's, um, oh, God. Uh, Bellini no Bellini. you know what I can't I'm gonna say the name of the drink I never say it right so if you look up anyway if you see it in the on the Pinacoteca de Bra, they have a great um, you know online catalog that you can look through but it's a beautiful strange painting that is just so filled with grief so I hold this up to show them and then I burst into tears and I couldn't stop crying and I couldn't talk and I was laughing at the same time because it was absolutely absurd and they're all trying to psychoanalyze me everybody's trying to help me basically get control of my emotions and figure out what was going on and so I thought okay I'm going to put that away for later because I think I need to figure that out and so that kind of made me realize I think there's more to it than the essay but the essay could stand on its own. And um, and then my fellow uh, writers there gave me some encouragement as well to keep going. So that was in 2016. And then I kept writing. And I guess by 2019, I had most of a draft finished. And then, of course, with COVID, everything got slowed down. But it is interesting that at first I thought it was contained in this one part. And through talking about it with other writers and exploring other aspects of it, I started to realize what what else there was and where I had to go with it. Although the way there was definitely not clear at that point. And it took some fumbling around. And the odd thing for me is that I, I had organized the book slightly differently and it wasn't really working. I had all of this information and it wasn't until I was taking a walk in the countryside in Umbria. I remember exactly the part. I turned the corner. I saw the old tennis court with all the, the cracks and the weeds growing up through it and I suddenly because every time I passed the tennis court I remember having this moment but I suddenly realized I needed to organize the book the way that the the artwork is organized so that was why I decided to start each chapter in the Sistine Chapel and to take it chunk by chunk piece by piece in that way and once I did it everything I already had just fit in it was just needed that little thing to help me sort of figure out what I was doing, that structure. 
And that was uh, that was probably two years into the writing at that point where I, uh, you know, there's so much that I left out, so much that I took out as well, because there's so much, there's just so much. It's this, you know, I, I'm only scratching the surface here on this incredible piece of art. But once I did that, that was actually uh, an interesting sort of, you know, aha moment to realize that if I follow the artwork, the rest of the story falls into place. Oh, that's that's really interesting to know because I, as I was reading the book, I looked at the structure of the book and was trying to to put it all together, and it dawned on me when I got to I think part three, that's what was going that's what was going on. Um, so there's a question that we have here about was there a specific art criticism that influenced you in writing this book? Hmm, um, not so specific, although I certainly. Uh, I, I was reading a lot of art criticism and um, yeah, the one the uh, John Berger, of course, and his approach always comes to mind. He's so influential because he's written, you know, he wrote novels and, you know, uh, odd books like the Red Tenda of Bologna, like that's a fantastic book. Doesn't, I don't know where that fits in any genre, but it's a wonderful book. And so his kind of freedom was certainly part of it. His way of looking at art was also a part of it, but also um, Robert Hughes and his wonderful advice to just shut up and look, like just st stop, stop asking a million questions, stop looking at, I'm trying to figure out what everybody else thinks and just be quiet and take a look. And that was actually great advice as well. So, yeah, but I'm not, I, you know, I never studied art history, so I don't, I'm not I, I I thought of it more I thought about it more in terms of writing than in uh, studying art in that sense I thought about more like uh, creative nonfiction storytelling that was the sort of I wanted to tell an interesting story because it was so interesting to me and I think that's what that's what was driving me more than anything. So um, we have time for um, one or two more questions. One of the questions that has come up is that um, your son plays a part in this book. How does he feel about being in the book? And how does he feel about the trips to the, to, to the Sistine Chapel? I can't get him to go again, which is a shame. Um, he does, he did tell me, he came to a reading I did last week and he told me afterwards that he thinks he will read this book now. He's 18 now. And so, you know, it has been going on for a long time. And he was just a kid when we started. I think he was 10 when I took him with his friend to visit. And he and I have been walking in and out of churches for his whole life. And there was a certain point when he was going to an Italian school and his teacher was Catholic. And she would give them a lot of, they would she would explain a lot about, you know, Christian stories because he wasn't getting this at home. And so we would go into the churches and he would start to tell me what he was looking at and narrate things. So I realized he understood a lot of what he was seeing. But um, by the time we got to the Sistine Chapel, he was starting to find that maybe it was less interesting to him. I, I was heartened to know that he went off with some friends recently. They took the train just to see how far they could go before they had to pay an extra fare. I think they got to Viterbo. And uh, he told me the story that, you know, we went to go into a church and then I didn't hear, hear the rest of the story. I just thought they went into a church. You know, it was fantastic. <laughs> it was so great. I was just delighted that they would do that on their own. So he um, he did give me permission to use the photographs of him as a small child that I used there. And he said it was OK to to talk about our life he doesn't come into it too much but a little bit here and there and I suppose in the last chapter because he did come with me to Orvieto when we went to look at uh Signorelli's um last uh um sorry his uh oh god now I'm forgetting the name the um the pic the one with the antichrist in it you know that was the way I got him there was there's a picture of the antichrist on a church wall and he said okay let's go see so He's little, he's, he's, you know, he's an 18 year old cool guy now. So he doesn't really, he doesn't give me too much, but he seems okay. He seems fine with it. And he seems even halfway interested. So, so that's pretty good. That That is really good to hear. There's hope. There's hope for parents. <laughs> uh, I know. Kids, right? you know. 
Yeah, find 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 the picture of the devil, the Antichrist, and see if they'll see if they'll come to a museum with you. Let's yes. close out on one uh, one uh, aspect of the book that I found absolutely fascinating, and that is the idea of graffiti and the Roman soldiers and the graffiti. And I think Judy has some pictures of that, so maybe she could show show the pictures, and you can give a a quick recap before we close out the event of what of what's going on with the graffiti. Okay. So um, so this one is from the Villa Farnesina, and there's actually a, quite a bit of graffiti in there. And so this was the house that was owned by the papal banker. And, but by the time, so 1527, when the sack of Rome happened, uh, he was gone. And the, um, the soldiers actually took over the villa. So they were living in it and they scrawled things all over the place. And Quite a bit of it is still preserved. I took some pictures in, of other little parts of it too, but in this one, this is the one I can't read it, but it says in German that um, that the Lanskanets have got the Pope on the run at this point here, and it, this is actually 1528. It says, and that's because they were there for nine or ten months. I think they were there for a long time. Uh, then the plague came, and in fact, they went up to Narni and Calvi del Umbria, which is where we have a little house, and they sacked Narni, and they terrorized Calvi del Umbria as well. And then when the plague sort of lifted a bit more, they went back to Rome and continued sacking it for, for another period of time. So they were living in this place, and they were scrawling, and to think, you know, to scrawl on on frescoes on the wall is just so disrespectful. I kind of, you know, it's fascinating to see it because you know they were angry and there's that sense of themselves being disrespected, their own anger. The Germans were, the Lanskinex were probably the most um, influenced by Luther. There were others who were not, but they were a part of it. And you do get that sense of, of um, that self-righteous anger that is, that is in just in doing something like this. And there's another one that we couldn't photograph. It's really hard to see. The first time I saw it, I didn't actually realize what I was looking at until I've been trying to find it again. But there's a Raphael fresco in the museums and someone has scratched Luther in one little square, but you have to get really close and you have to see it. It was scratched in apparently with the point of a, a knife. And the reason we know for sure that that happened is because uh, Benvenuto Cellini, who wrote a book about basically sort of being everywhere all at once, it's a very unreliable book, but he was, a contemporary and he does he he claims to have been there and witnessed this soldier actually scratching his scratching the name of luther into that that fresco right in the vatican museums which would have been the pope's apartments in fact and so there's other graffiti there and it's somewhat hard to know what is from the sack of rome and what's from a little later there's some they can certainly date from the 1600s but there's quite a bit that's also pretty certain to be from this period. The date 1527 is scratched in somewhere as well. You don't notice it so much because you go in and there are these powerful, incredible frescoes in this room. And Judy and I were there together once. And I said, come here, come here you have to see. You have to get really close and shine your, your, your iPhone flashlight on it. And then you can see all of the scratching that's going on just below the level of the fresco. It's also a frescoed part, but it's not the part that's done by Raphael. And you can see that it just runs all the way around the room. Hmm. Hmm. Um, all right, that's uh, that's really something. Um, and thank you, thank you so much for sharing that. Judy and, and Jeannie, uh, thank you. This has been a really interesting and very informative um, conversation about the Sistine Chapel and about Christianity and Catholicism and the person and men and all that. I encourage everybody to buy this book. Um, it's It really is a phenomenal book. And um, we look forward to seeing you at the next Birch Park event. Thank you so very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Bye.